بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لسان يفقه قولي My dear and respected viewers and listeners Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh I welcome you all to our daily juice summary Today we are looking at juice 21 21st juice of the Quran already This obviously tells us that we are about to enter the last third of Ramadan, subhanAllah. In today's Jews, we have a few surahs to talk about. As I told you yesterday, Surah Al-Ankabut, uh, which I didn't give you the translation of, I apologize for that, means the spider, <clears throat> was obviously already in the past Jews and a couple of pages from this Jews, but I would like to begin from it because of one section or one ayah really uh, in those two pages, which is critical important. After Surah Al-Ankabut, which is Surah 29 of the Qur'an, <clears throat> we have Surah Ar-Rum, means the Romans. And then after that, we have Surah Luqman, a chapter which is named after Luqman, either a very pious servant of Allah or maybe even a prophet of Allah. <clears throat> and then after that, we have Surah As-Sajda. There's a Surah which is called As-Sajda, which means the actual ritual of Sajda falling down on the ground in prostration. And we also have a few pages of Surah Al-Ahzab that makes today's Jews, 21st Jews of the Quran. So we will try, inshallah, to review as many as possible of those surahs. Uh, <clears throat> all those revelations up to Surah Al-Ahzab are also Meccan period. They're all Mecki revelations, but Surah Al-Ahzab is one of the latest surahs to be revealed. Uh, fifth or sixth year after uh, Hijra, so it's a Madani surah, and the content is really different from all those other surahs that we will look at in today's Jews. But maybe uh, tomorrow we can look at Surah Al-Azab in more detail. <clears throat> so <clears throat> from Surah Al-Ankabut, we have this fifth section, <clears throat> Ayah 45 and 46, which is right at the beginning of uh, Jews uh, 21. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet Muhammad, Recite to them what is sent of the book by inspiration to you. And establish regular prayer. For prayer restrains from shameful and just unjust deeds. And remembrance of Allah is the greatest thing in life, with no doubt. And Allah knows all that you do. So this ayah, subhanAllah, I hope you, you have caught the main passage really there, which I want to focus on. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs his Prophet وسلم, to recite the Holy Quran to them. Uh, means when Allah sends a new revelation, you go and, and basically announce it, like read it out and, and share this new revelation with as many people as possible in a way. So Muslims and, and non-Muslims, and you never know who will accept Islam by listening to some portion or passage of the Quran. But we say that this verb, utlu, it's really the basis of tilawa. tartila. Yeah, tilawa. Which means recitation of the Holy Quran. So rehearsing or reciting the Quran. But we also say that Naqra'ul Qur'an, we read Qur'an to ourselves, okay? So we recite it for other people to hear, but we also read Qur'an, you know, like you can read it within yourself. Look and read, like you can read, and for that you will have reward as well, just to yourself, not reading it out loud to someone else. And the third uh, notion which we have, the relationship which we can have with the Qur'an and us using the noble verses is to study the Qur'an. So the next layer is like the Rasatul Qur'an, the study of the Qur'an, when you read like, like these summaries and contemplate over some sections of the Qur'an. So it's not just we are not reading only today. We are reading some passages, of course. I'm not reciting really any, like in a melodic voice, but uh, we are mainly focusing on understanding its message. That is the whole point. So here... Allah told the Prophet ﷺ to do that and to establish regular prayers. And why is establishing uh, prayers very important? Why does the Quran say, the Quran could have said, pray, sallu, which is a command as well, pray. 
But the Quran doesn't say that. Quran says, أقم الصلاة وإقام الصلاة إقامة الصلاة مقيمين الصلاة Always in the Quran, when Allah SWT mentions prayer, he mentions this notion of establishing regular prayers, like being punctual on our prayers. Why? Because it's one of the five pillars of Islam, and arguably, we can say, the most important practice of our religion. If we miss on this notion, on this pillar, like we don't establish our prayers, or we are not punctual with our prayers, we are neglectful with our prayers, or we can't be bothered, we find it very difficult to, to establish our prayers, then we run risks of falling in other sins as well. Why? Because this very prayer which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed on us, made it, made it obligatory on us five times a day, <clears throat> is the very shield between us and the, and, and the sinful act. And not only sinful, shameful acts as well. So <clears throat> this is what the Quran says: "Inna salat tanha an al-fahshai wal-munkar." Why should we establish prayers? Because prayer restrains from shameful and and unjust deeds. So means wrong deeds. So in other words, the prayer is like a shield. It's a very important ritual for us. And prayer is like really a best combination because in prayer we make dua, like we really pray to Allah, especially in sujood. Uh, in prayer we send peace and salutations upon the Prophet ﷺ. In prayer we recite Quran, we read the Quran, right? We really, really recite it. <clears throat> we have to. In prayer we stand, we also bow down and we also go down to sujood. So it's a really amazing uh, ritual uh, when we think about it, composes of so many things. We glorify Allah. We open the prayer by praising Allah and glorifying Him. Thana. Yeah, Alhamdu wa Thana. <clears throat> we must say the opening chapter in every rak'ah, Surah Al Fatiha. So it's like a really, you know, uh, really beneficial practice or let's say ritual, <clears throat> which doesn't take very long time, five minutes. You can pray a decent prayer in five minutes, doesn't have to be 12 or half an hour or more. But of course, we know the Prophet, especially when he prayed to himself, like optional prayer at night, the night vigil prayer, he used to prolong his prayer very much, not as much as he would do that when he was praying in congregation with other companions. Then he will be more alert of who is praying behind him, like we do the same thing. When we lead a congregational prayer, we don't make it very long on purpose, because there might be some weak people, might be some children, ladies, and so on. <clears throat> but even for the five minutes we spend in our prayer, we feel a very nice and very uh, useful uh, spiritual transformation every time we pray. So think about it, praying you know, every day, five times a day for years and years and years, how much good that will do for you and how much will it protect you from uh, shameful and sinful acts very much indeed it's an armor or a shield that you can you know build very strong and it can basically cover all of you and protect you from everything inshallah ta'ala so i hope you know this stays with us and this also phrase is not mentioned for no reason Akbar. So remembrance of Allah is the greatest thing ever. And, and in the prayer, we remember Allah, of course. So uh, I just wanted to share this one from Surah Al-Ankabut. Now I will go to the next uh, surah. This surah has another two sections, actually. I mean, another, sorry, another one section, section six. The concluding one, which is also a really important point. Like I told you yesterday, this surah was revealed when it was the harshest conditions they had the hardest time for muslims in mecca the general boycott uh, they were heavily persecuted so this surah came to encourage them and at the end of this surah allah says oh my servants who believe truly spacious is my earth therefore serve me alone pray to me alone every soul shall have a taste of death and in the end, you will all be uh, returned back to me. So Allah SWT is basically like gi giving them encouragement and permission. If this uh, place where you live now is not a good, right place for you to practice your religion or persecution, then you can migrate and go elsewhere. And we understand that after this, uh, uh, the first Muslims really did seek shelter in Abyssinia, 
in Habasha. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that, like, the earth belongs to Allah. I said to many of my friends, I, you know, sometimes I think I was not born in this country, but I happened to come to study here, and now I'm living here, working here. Uh, I really think, like, every single human has the right to live anywhere in the world, because the entire earth, I believe, belongs to Allah. You know, and anyone, wherever they find their provisions, means like job, rizq, uh, place of, uh, you know, livelihood, place of residence, let them be that their residence, you know. So in, in that sense, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna ardi wasi'a, you know, my, my, uh, the earth is spacious, like there's enough space for all of you. Why you are possessing something and not allowing certain people to step on that soil? I don't understand this uh, attitude, you know, of closing borders and this and that. But anyhow, uh, we are supposed to obviously be patient and rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the surah says, and know that no one can take our provisions from us. Yeah, and Allah says that as well here. How many are the creatures that carry not their own sustenance? It is Allah who feeds both them and you, for he is all hearing and all knowing. So this is it, like uh, Allah is uh, really in charge. And the last ayah, and those who strive in our cause, we will certainly guide them to our path or our path. For verily Allah is with those who do right. So a lot of people say like, uh, the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the straight path, means the religion of Islam, uh, submitting to Allah's will. And if you make an effort, Allah will be there to help you. And he will make sure you stay on the right course, on the right path. And Allah is indeed with those who are righteous. That's how the surah ends. Next surah is surah 30 of the Quran, surah ar rum which means the Romans. Interesting that uh, uh, we have this as the main heading, maybe the great empires. So <clears throat> interestingly, the Quran mentions, makes reference in a way. Here, the Romans are mentioned by name, but the reference is also made to uh, there are, you know, like main rivals or enemies, the rival empire at the time, the Persian Empire, the Furs. So great empires, the Quran tells us in a way in this surah, in summary, rise and they fall. So they, they can sometimes win, conquer, but they will also be conquered, yeah, won against. And this is what happened with the you know, Roman and Persian empires. So it was really indeed that you know, around the time when this surah was revealed, that the Persians were defeating Romans in more than one place, it seems like, or they were like on top of them. But then the things changed in the favor of the Romans and they started... Uh, winning over the Persians. And then even those two great empires finished. And you can even say like the, the great empire of Islam, uh, you know, rose, uh, or let's say like the Ottoman Empire, conquering huge portions of the world, the French Empire and different, different empires, they all came and they are now long, like we just talk about them when we read history books, gone, forgotten. But what happens is the truth will always prevail, will always be there. So <clears throat> everything happens according to Allah's decree, decision. And Allah tells us in this surah that he will always make the truly righteous, the believers to rejoice. There might be some, you know, like persecution and test and tribulations, but at the end, you will actually rejoice. Men may see, but the outward cursed of things, but in the truth, the end of things is all in all. And in his own good time, he will spare good from, separate good from evil. Praise and glory be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forever. This is in a way like a little summary of the whole surah. So if you don't believe me, I'll just read one or two ayahs in the beginning, which mention the Roman Empire. So Allah says, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, Alif Lamim. The Roman Empire has been defeated in a land close by. But they, even after this defeat of theirs, will soon be victorious. Within a few years, with Allah is the decision. In the past and in the future, on that day shall the believers rejoice. With the help of Allah, he helps whomever he wills 
and he is exalted in might, most merciful. It is the promise of Allah. Never does Allah depart from his promise, but most men understand not. They know but the outer things in the, in the life of this world, but of the end of things, they are heedless. Well, isn't this a very powerful, very strong opening passage, really, of uh, Surah Rum? Indeed, it is. I personally like it. I like reciting this in prayers as well. So maybe a couple of things to mention here. So the Roman Empire mentioned here, uh, and if the Quran says they've been defeated, indirectly we know they were defeated by who? So the Persian Empire is mentioned. Then Allah says the things will change around. They will lose. So, and then one more thing I just want to mention here from these ayahs. Fi bida within a few years. So around the time when this surah was revealed, this is what was happened in the, the uh, like middle Meccan period or to, going towards the, 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 the later Meccan period. So a few years later, the, the Prophet and, and the early Muslims would migrate, as we know, to Medina. So even that notion of like the earth being spacious for everyone, go where it's best for you. So... When they came to Medina two years later after Israel, the great battle of Badr took place. So a lot of uh, scholars, they say it was around that time, soon after the battle of Badr, around that time, that the Romans got the better of the Persian empire. Like they defeated them. They, you know, the Persians suffered a heavy defeat in one of the great battles. I don't know exactly which. It's not so maybe even important, but there are different uh, suggestions given because probably they had several battles, battles in that stretch of time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the believers means the, the Prophet Muhammad and he, the believing party with him, yeah, with the article L, will rejoice. So they had the double rejoice actually at that time. Uh, they won the battle of Badr by some huge miracles. And we spoke about that uh, on Friday live last uh, Friday, this last Friday. Um, but then the news came to them about the Romans defeating the Persians. So they were happy about that. And people say, like, why would they be happy? You know, they became like their enemies later on. They were happy for one reason, and it's obvious reason, actually, that the Roman Empire, what, in whatever degree, right, they, they also, they were like Christians, okay, at that time. So they were believing in God as well, in one God. Whereas the Persians, or that uh, Persian Empire at that time, they were worshipping idols, you know, like fire and, and different things. So uh, from that point of view, uh, you know, when, when, when the news came and the prophet told them like that they should celebrate or be happy, uh, that was the reasoning he gave them. Like they are like our brothers in religion in that sense. So the Christians and the uh, Jews are, you know, also believers in God. So if there is a war between uh, people who believe in God, and those who do not believe in God, then of course, the party that believes in God will feel uh, something about uh, uh, their core religion is gaining victory over idol worshippers. But it's mainly paganism, really. Okay, paganism. Uh, so this is what the Quran mentioned here. And maybe one more point is like, uh, yeah, most people, it does seem like all they know is the outward. Uh, outer things, okay, uh, what is apparent, obvious. Inward things, they can't get these messages. They just struggle. So this is the other thing I wanted to mention here. Uh, this surah has, you know, one section. Uh, section two is also very powerful, talking about, uh, like some scholars, they say we should read these some of these verses from this surah, uh, like as a dhikr, morning and evening dhikr, because Allah says, so give glory to Allah when you when you reach even tide and when you rise in the morning, like so in the evening and in the morning, glorify Allah. So you can even read this uh, ayah or two. To him belongs all praise. Walahul hamdu in the heavens and on earth, and in the late afternoon and when the day begins to decline. So that's why the scholars they say you know this is mentioned. So we should be alert of those timings yeah those times and and praise Allah at those times like make some kind of form of dhikr in the second section but the third section of this surah is giving us plenty of signs that we can contemplate over from Allah in order to understand 
and believe in, in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah's signs are many, and so are his mysteries. Yet each does point to his unity, to his existence and tawheed, also to his goodness and his power and his might and mercy. There is none like unto him, like nothing is like Allah. So his teaching is one, and men, men that split up his standard religion are but following their own desires, lusts. Ungrateful are they to give part worship to others beside Allah, when all worship and praise and glory are due to him and him alone, in whom we have our life and being. And really, I'm telling you, this is a kind of summary of section three. This is what these signs really mean to us. So let me try to read in a very quick way, uh, one after the other, the signs that I mentioned. Really, all ayah begin the same way. Among his sign, signs is this, that he created you from dust. And then behold, you are men scattered far and, far and right, like many people came. Again, and among his signs is this, that he created for you mates from among yourselves, from you, so that you may find peace and tranquility in them. And he has put love and mercy between your hearts. Verily, in that are signs for those who reflect. And so, I mean, of course, this ayah is very famous for marriage occasions and talks about the love and, and mercy between spouses. But I can't really talk about that now. So let me just move on. And among his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth. And the variations in your languages, like varieties of your languages and your colors. Verily in that are signs for those who have knowledge, who know. And among his signs, so look here, this one, like diversity, yeah? the creation of the heavens and the earth, uh, the different languages, different colors, shapes, forms of humans, all signs from Allah pointing to the one. And among his signs is the sleep that you take by night and by day, like you, you go out. And the guest that you make, you know, uh, you work hard for your livelihood in daytime, out of Allah's bounty, because he gave you that light to see and, and strive. Verily, that are signs for those who can hear, okay? And again, and among his signs, he shows you the lightning by way both of fear and of hope. And he sends down rain from the sky. And when it, when it gives life to the earth after it was dead, verily, in that are signs for those who are intelligent, wise. And again, another eye. And among his signs is this, that heaven and earth stand by his command. Then when he calls you all by a single call from the earth, behold, you shall come forth straight, straight where you will come forth. Like either antum takhrujun, some scholars say like either here indicates like subsequently straight after that you will all rise. Yeah, resurrection. So these are signs that this surah mentions, amazing signs. Really, and the conclusion, the next ayah, to him belongs every being that is in the heavens and on earth. All are devoutly obedient to him. Kullun lahu qanitun, everything. Uh, so it is only the human, subhanallah, that we exercise this free choice of will that Allah gave us. And they, you know, some humans choose to rebel, na'uzubillah. And how can we resist that? Why these signs are not really making us realize? And why are they not pointing to us to the one? Yet yeah, the true God whom we should pray and worship and no other but him. So set your face steadily and truly to the faith. Establish Allah's handiwork according to the pattern on which he has made mankind. No change let there be in the work by Allah. That is the standard religion, but most among mankind understand not. So basically this is the call like... So Allah gives all these reasons and then Allah gives the command to the Prophet and all of us. So turn your face to Allah. Yeah. But steadily and truly to the faith of Allah with purity of intention, like uh, no notions of shirk or anything wrong. Just worship him alone, one God. On what? The handiwork according to the pattern on which he made mankind. Uh, it's a good translation, I have to say. I really like Abdullah Yusuf Ali, but 
what it really means is like the uncorrupt nature, the purity on which we were all born. That's what it is. Fitrat Allah illati nas alayha. So we were all born pure. That's why we say children are innocent. Uh, and it is later on that we can actually corrupt this soul of ours or, or heart and also our nature. We can develop some bad traits and habits. So I like this ayah as well. Uh, so uh, it's very strong. Um, yeah, there's a warning here also. Those who split up their religion and become mere sects, each party rejoicing in that which is with, it, with itself. So in a way, if you switch it around, it's like a stern warning not to disunite our ranks, yeah, our rows, but not to become sects. Yeah? لا uh, تفرقوا like Surah Ali Imran says don't yeah, uh, don't split into sects and units stay united in other words uh, hold you know steadily onto the rope of Allah together yeah. be like brethren in, in religion like brothers and sisters in religion in one united okay this is uh, that section. Section five has one ayah which is really amazing in today's time and age. Allah said here, Mischief has appeared on land and sea because of what the hands of men have earned, what we have done. And that Allah may give them a taste of some of their deeds in order that they may turn to Allah yeah, and may leave, uh, let's say, practicing evil, change their ways to good. Uh, so I like this ayah uh, because uh, this ayah is a very strong argument that we don't complain against Allah in any way, even if there's a big natural calamity, even if there's lots of loss of life or property or, or, or crops, we can't uh, complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because uh, the things, yeah, the mischief, the, the things which we don't like, uh, which are happening to us and around us, we are also partly to be blamed. It's because of our deeds and our actions. Uh, there's one more ayah which I really uh, find like a huge mark of this surah right at the end. Uh, so I might want to read to you this section six, which is the very last section of the surah. It's so plain, believe me, uh, but I, I love the way the argument is put in here. It's very blatant, but to me, I think it's very strong you know, forceful. Uh, okay, Allah says here, uh, it is he who created you in a state of helplessness, yeah, weakness, then gave you strength after weakness, then after strength, he gave you weakness and a hoary head, like gray head. He creates as he wills, and it is he who has all knowledge and power. Basically, different stages of our life. Weak babies, grow in strength, then again get weaker, then old, yeah, gray hairs, and then we perish. Allah does whatever he wants in his creation. But this is the section really like, it starts from this ayah which I read, but this next ayah is very strong to me. On the day that the hour of reckoning will be established, the transgressors will swear that they tarried not but an hour, like they stayed just an hour, they lived for an hour. مَا لَبِثُوا غَيْرَ سَاعَةً Thus, where they used to being deluded, like didn't understand. But those end, endued with knowledge, those who are given knowledge and faith, Iman will say, Indeed, you did tarry, you did stay within Allah's decree until the day of resurrection. You lived as long as Allah gave you to live. Yeah? Uh, to the day of resurrection. And this is the day of resurrection. But you were not aware of it. You didn't want to know this. So on that day, on the day of resurrection, no excuse of theirs will avail the transgressors. Nor will they be invited then to seek grace by repentance. Can't repent then, it's too late. Verily we have propounded for men in this Quran every kind of parable, example. But if you bring to them any sign, the unbelievers are sure to say, yes, do nothing but talk vanities. Like they say, that's useless, nothing. 
So in this way does Allah seal up the hearts of those who understand not. So Muhammad and us Muslims patiently preserve, be patient, fasbir. For verily the promise of Allah is true, it will come. Nor let those shake your firmness who have themselves no certainty of faith. They, they, they doubt religion and they, they can't become believers. Wasn't this an easy section to listen and understand? But um, really powerful. You know, subhanAllah. May Allah protect us on the day of resurrection and that we are those people who are strong and certain in our religion, in our faith, in our iman. And not among those who will regret on the day, but it'll be too late. Uh, no, uh, no apology accepted. No, no chance to repent then, to turn to Allah in repentance. So may Allah uh, protect us, inshallah. So that is the surah of Ar uh, the end of Surah Arum. The next surah is Surah Luqman, chapter 31, really short chapter. So maybe I read one uh, page uh, from this surah, only or few ayahs from it. Like I said, uh, late Meccan period as well, uh, like uh, Surah Rum, probably late Meccan period, like maybe two or three years before Hijrah, something like that. So Surah Luqman also begins with Alif Lamim, like a Rum. There's a stretch of them now, Alif Lamim, with Ankebut, Rum, and Luqman, and Sajda, the same. And the Quran is mentioned first, Tilkat al Kitab al Hakim, but here it says the wise book, a guide and a mercy to, the, uh, to those who are righteous. But the, the previous surah said, guide and good news, glad tidings. Uh, so here is hudan wa rahmatan lil muhsineen. Very similar opening statement. But the, the section I want to read to you is the, the one uh, which mentions Luqman. So this surah is called Luqman because we don't have uh, uh, Sayyidina Luqman mentioned in other surahs really. And uh, as I told you, the scholars differ. Lots of people say he was a sage. Uh, saint, uh, but there are uh, lots of scholars say that, but there are some scholars who suggest Allah Alam, maybe he was a prophet of Allah. So listen to this beautiful section. It's a lot to do with parenting, actually, this section, because Sayyidina Luqman was given wisdom, as you will hear here, and gave some beautiful advice to his children and to us, of course, in extension. So we bestowed in the past wisdom on Luqman. Show your gratitude to Allah. So be grateful to Allah for it. Any who is so grateful does so to the, to the benefit of their own soul. But if any is ungrateful, verily, Allah is free of all wants, worthy of all praise. So if we are grateful, it's for our benefit. If we are not, we, we can't cause any, any harm to, to, to Allah because Ghani Mahmid, he is free of all wants, uh, worthy of all praise. So behold, when Luqman said to his son by way of instruction, he advised his son, وَهُوَ يَعِذُهُ يَا بُنَيَّ O my dear son, O my little son, join not in worship others with Allah, for false worship is indeed the highest of wrong, uh, the most, you know, the, the, the biggest mistake you can make. Uh, in, fa in fact, if we translate it very literally, it says like, it's a grave transgression, injustice, the biggest injustice, he says, Zulum, the highest wrong, you can say, the most cardinal sin. And we stand by that in Islamic law. So uh, he gives advice to his son, don't commit shirk, of course, is the gravest of all sins. So first advice. And then he says, and we have enjoined on man to be good to, the, to his parents, uh, to their parents. So in travail upon travail did his mother bear him, and in years twain was his weaning. Hear the command, show gratitude to me and to thy parents, to your parents. To me is your final return. So basically this notion of being kind uh, to parents, yeah, to one's parents, especially the mother, because she had to bear what? Carrying child in the tummy, sometimes two, like I'm a twin, two, and some ladies, three children. It's very hard, uh, we can imagine, heavy, burden, burdensome. And then even they have to deliver the child, which is additional pain, very, very painful. And then even uh, apart from that, they have to breastfeed the child. And then even they have to basically separate, weaning, yeah, which is fisaluhu, within two years, the Quran says here. Okay, and in two years, like 
the, the weaning period comes in fitam or fisal, which is very painful as it seems to mom because mom is attached to the child and the child to the mom through that milk, yeah, the relationship. So it's something very hard. So especially the mother uh, sh should be kind to and the father, of course. So uh, this is what the Quran says here. And then, but if they strive to make you join in worship with me, like commit shirk, things of which you have no knowledge, obey them not. Yeah, so we have to be kind to parents, so kind, and not being kind to them is seen as maybe second gravest sin, really, in some traditions after shirk. Uh, or being rude to them, I should say, like not respecting your parents. But even then, we are kind to them, but we can't obey them if they are telling us to do unlawful things. Haram. So we don't. Uh, so you bear, yet bear them company in this life with justice, like and consideration, kindness, and follow the way of those who turn to me in love. In the end, the return of you all is to me. And I will tell you uh, the truth and the meaning of all that you did. So in, in this section is this kindness to parents. And then again, Luqman. Oh, my son, said Luqman, if there be but the weight of a mustard seed, and if it were hidden in a rock or anywhere in the heavens or on earth, Allah will bring it forth. For Allah understands the finer mysteries and is well aware of, of them all. In Allah latifun. Khabir, the, the most subtle things Allah is aware of and aware of everything, well aware of everything. So he says, basically, whatever you do, don't think Allah is not going to uh, ask you about it. It will be brought forward, like Surah Zalzala, Misqal an atom of weight. Oh, my son, Ya Bunayya, establish regular prayer, enjoin what is just and forbid what is wrong, and bear with patience, yeah, uh, the calamities, whatever has fallen on you. For this is firmness of purpose in the conduct of, of matters or affairs. So very strong advice, establishing regular prayers, enjoining good, forbidding evil, and bearing patiently over trials and tribulations, calamities. Asabek is like musiba, could be disease, illness, or anything, loss of any wealth, money, yeah, or even life or property. And then he said, I like this advice. And swell not your cheek for pride at people, nor walk in insolence through the earth or on the earth. For Allah loves not any arrogant uh, boaster. Yeah, mukhtal in fakhur, boastful and arrogant people. So he says, swell not, you're like, why you're showing off, you know, being too proud and walking with insolence. Okay. Wala tamshi fil ardi maraha. You know, like showing off you are the best person. Allah doesn't like that. And be moderate in your pace. Okay. Waqsid fi mashik. Like even when you walk, be moderate. And over your voice, don't shout. Don't talk very loud. For the harshest of sounds, with no doubt, is the braying of the ass. So donkeys uh, braying doesn't sound very pleasing to our ears. This is something what Allah wants to say here. So being too loud, like. And it does seem from when you compare the other animals, if you heard like the sheep, you know, they may annoy you as well, but it's not going to be as loud straight away to shock you and also annoy you as the donkey will. Even the horse will not do like donkey uh, and other animals as well, if you, have, if you are familiar with animal uh, sounds. So that was the section of Luqman, and I think I'm afraid I have to end explanation of this surah there, if I'm to do anything else, really, but I know there are few verses here which are amazing uh, like this and if all the trees on earth were pens and the ocean were ink with seven oceans behind it to add to its supply you would not yeah, yet would not the words of Allah be exhausted in the writing for Allah is exalted exalted in power full of wisdom so Allah's words like uh, you can't write it it will not be exhausted and your creation or your resurrection is in no wise, but as an individual soul, like nothing easy for Allah. If he created one and then resurrected one only so, Allah is all hearing and all seeing. I, I, I mean, very strong two ayahs. Indeed, no need to explanation really. It's like very, very strong. 
the last I there's a lot of lovely, nice stories about this I, but let me just read it in translation. Allah says at the end, verily the knowledge of the hour is with Allah alone. Nobody knows when the last hour will come. It is he who sends down rain. Okay, and he knows what is in the wombs, yeah, of mom in the wombs. So even the rain, like we really don't know if it's going to rain right now or not. Nowadays we can observe the clouds and we see how it is and we can see, okay, it's the likelihood of rain is there. But do we know like in 11 days time, is it going to rain in Cambridge or not? Nobody knows. Allah knows. He sends it down when, when, when he sees it. He, Allah knows fully what's in the wombs. Yeah, you, you know, like we can say, ah, oh, but we know nowadays the gender, right? No, not like that. Allah knows exactly what's in the wombs, uh, you know, before even was before before it was conceived, right? We only know in latter stages uh, we might find out the gender, but that's not the point here. The point is that Allah knows if there's life in there or not. We don't know until the baby is born whether it's going to be a, a living baby born or is a stillbirth. Allah knows everything. And then he says, nor does anyone know what, he, what it is that he will earn tomorrow, on the morrow. In this sense, this is not literally tomorrow what you're going to earn, but it means like you don't know your future, your future career, your future job very much. Uh, things can, can work out totally against your expectations. Nor does anyone know in what land he or she is going to die. And this is also true, subhanAllah. Like I just told you earlier on, I was not born here. Where will I die? Allahu Alam. I don't know uh, in which place uh, I, and when and how will I die, but we will all die. Verily, with Allah is the full knowledge of all things, and He is aware of all things, all knowing, all aware. Do we know everything? <laughs> no, we know only very few things. So, very amazing uh, ayah indeed. Some scholars say like secrets of these things only are known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But again, the point is not to question, yes, I also know this and that. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can observe the clouds. No, the whole point really is that all those things that we mentioned in that ayah and all the signs that we mentioned in Surah Rum and uh, other surahs should lead us, point towards the one. That's the whole point. Surah Sajda. So it's called the Sajda because there's Sajda in it. Okay, and it's a very short chapter as well, uh, late Meccan period, as I said. Uh, only three pages. Uh, I'll see, maybe um, I can read one ayah, uh, one or two ayahs uh, for you from this surah. Maybe this about the sajda. So you will see why it's called sajda, like the most powerful maybe ayah of sajda, and therefore the surah became known as the surah of sajda only those believe in our signs who when they are recited to them so signs here means ayat verses of quran when they are read to them recited to them they fall down in adoration kharru sujadan yeah in sajda and celebrate the praises of their lord nor are they ever puffed up with pride their limbs do forsake their beds of sleep the while they call on their Lord in fear and hope and they spend in charity out of the provision which we have bestowed on them. Subhanallah. So this is like, this, these are the verses which, where the sajda actually takes place uh, and a very strong, very powerful, uh, really message. So may Allah make us among those like people who when they hear the Quran read, we have this kind of feeling. Okay, we develop this feeling and awe and reverence and respect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and glorify him, praise him, celebrate his praises. That we also, uh, you know, leave some night, don't go to sleep the entire night and remember Allah in it, worship him because he, you know, he deserves to be worshipped in that way and it will do us so much good. And it's like we call upon Allah between fear and hope. Don't know if our du'as will be answered but we are hopeful. And even of charity we spend because whatever we have, Allah entrusted it to us. Uh, that one, it is in this surah which Allah mentions like again in a nice way, the way Allah created uh, humans. 
he who has made everything which he has created most good, the best shape and, and form, he began the creation of men with nothing more than clay, mintin, just clay was the beginning, and made his progeny, okay, uh, from a drop of the nature of a fluid despised. So, min sulalati min ma in mahin. So this is basically a spam, yeah, a bit of drop of spam. But he fashioned him in due proportion and breathed into him something of his spirit, of Allah's spirit. So this is where this uh, ayah is mentioned, like, وَنَفَخَ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِهِ And this is where the humans were elevated above other living creatures of Allah, about, about the rest of creation. So Allah fashioned us in due proportion, and breathed into the human uh, something of his spirit. And he gave you the faculties of hearing and seeing sight and feeling and understanding and little thanks yet do you give. And again, you are not grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a uh, very strong really said, uh, I already mentioned this, you know, how we excel uh, in comparison to, to the rest of Allah's creation. It is really this agency which Allah put in us, the, the ruh, spirit, which we have, that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, if we, you know, nurture, nourish this spirit with re reading Quran, understanding Quran, doing prayers, fasting, giving in charity, doing all the good things which Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to do and our Prophet showed us the way to do it, inshallah we'll free this spirit from all the shackles, yeah, all the burden, the things which are defining it like the nafs, the ego, the lower desires, the animalistic desires which are also within us. Inshallah ta'ala we will be able to have a very strong relationship, connection with our Lord Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from whom this spirit came and to whom it is going back. We are all going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I really read this hadith, obviously many times before, but yesterday again I read it, I think somebody came to become a Muslim a few days ago actually. And it's amazing, my brothers and sisters, like reading Quran, this Quran is not like any other speech. It's, it's kalamullah, yeah, al-qadim, al-munazzal, uh, eternal speech of Allah, okay? Uh, so, and it was always part of Allah. So it's part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that hadith really amazes me. Like uh, the Quran is also described as sabab, the means or the rope uh, uh, between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran itself, the, this, the, the phrases, the letters of Quran, the recitation, the sound, the voice, the Quran itself. And he says like on one side of the rope, on this end of the rope, fi tarafihi al sinatuku the tongue which pronounces it, which, which recites it, which reads it. And the, on the other side of the rope, at the other end of the rope, is Allah. You know, he's holding the other one. So, it, you know, basically it's like this. You know, it's, you can get so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by practicing these things, reading. So that's why we say our soul loves, the ruh, spirit loves the Quran and recitation of Quran. And even people who are not Muslims, believe me, if they hear a beautiful recitation of Quran, I'm sure it's going to have an effect on them. Somehow they're going to feel different. Whether they acknowledge it or not, is a different matter. So this is uh, what Allah mentions here in this surah. Uh, and a very strong reply to those people who, who question the, the, the possibility of resurrection. The surah Sajda answers that, uh, how it will happen. Surah Al-Ahzab, the next surah is uh, Surah 33 of the Quran. This is a Madani surah, as I said. It's quite long. Uh, but let me read maybe one or two ayahs from this part which belongs to Jews, to this Jews, today's Jews. Uh, and then we will read some other parts, inshallah ta'ala, uh, tomorrow, because they are also part of, of tomorrow's Jews. So in the beginning, <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nabi, O the Prophet of Allah, O the Prophet, fear Allah, ittaqillah, and don't listen, don't obey the non-believers or the hypocrites. Verily Allah, has, Allah knows everything and he's the wise. Instead, follow that which comes to you by revelation from your Lord. 
for Allah is well aware of what you do. And put your trust in Allah, and enough is Allah as a disposer of affairs for you. مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلِ مِنْ قَلْبَيْنِ Allah has not made for any man two hearts in his body, like in the chest. Nor has he made your wives, whom you divorce, by uh, like called the dhihar, uh, Arabian practice, like saying you are like my mother to me. So anyone who divorces them by saying zihar to them, like as if they are your mothers, nor has he made you your adopted sons, your own sons. Such is only your manner of speech by your own mouth or tongue or tongues. But Allah tells you the truth and he shows you the right way. Call them by their names, the names of the real fathers, that is more just in the eyes of Allah, juster. But if you know not their father's names, then call them your brothers in faith. Don't say they are your sons. Or say they are your like servants or, or friends. But there is no blame if you made a mistake therein. If you didn't know and then But what counts is when you, you, you intended it in your hearts, like you did it on purpose. But Allah is oft forgiving and most merciful. The Prophet is closer to the believers than their own selves, and his wives are their mothers. So the Prophet's wives are like our mothers. Blood relations among each other have closer personal ties in the decree of Allah than the brotherhood of religion, like believers uh, and the muhajirun, the, the migrants. Nevertheless, do you what is just to your closest friends such is the writing of the decree of the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So very interesting opening statement. Now you can see that the content is really different from what we read so far. Clear instruction to the Prophet والسلام, in this surah. This surah in a way is like known as also, uh, surah al-Ahzab means confederate, uh, alliance, the alliance, the pact that was made to fight against the Prophet والسلام, during the Battle of Trench, uh, or it's, it's even called ba the Battle of Hazab. Uh, so lots of personal reassurance and lots of personal actually matters are discussed in this war, issues of privacy, hijab, uh, divorce, marriage, but mainly the prophet's marriage, uh, him and his wives, uh, the mothers of the believers, as you can hear here, and their relationship to us, the other believers. So it's a very interesting surah. Uh, some very, you know, important rules and regulations have been established in this surah. And so much reassurance to the Prophet والسلام, because he was betrayed and cheated by certain people. Uh, as you can see, different Arabian tribes and even some, you know, the Jewish tribes that were in, in like peace agreement and proper agreement with, with him, they, you know, like cheated on him. They all confined together, yeah. Uh, made a pact, an alliance, yeah, united their efforts against the Prophet and wanted to finish him in Medina. So he was betrayed quite a lot around that time. So the Prophet والسلام, was given so much reassurance in this surah towards the end. And it is in this uh, surah that Allah re you know, revealed that ayah that Allah and his angels send peace and salutations upon the Prophet. Oh, you who believe, you also send peace and salutations upon him as a must, as an obligation. So and a very harsh stern warning to those who, who insult the Prophet ﷺ or fight against him or don't, they are not loyal to him, they don't obey him. So a very, uh, you know, lots of, lots of things very much related to the Prophet himself, personal and his family. And that's why there's another name for this surah, which means like the family of the Prophet. Uh, so if you want to find out more about the Prophet and, and his family, lots of scholars will say, then you memorize this surah or read this surah al-Ahzab, it will answer you. And here you can see, like, uh, the Prophet is more important to us than our own selves. So we must put him before our own selves. That's what it means. And, and his wives, they are like our mothers. Like, we, we respect them and treat them as if they were our real mothers, if not even more. But Allah says here in the same ayah, people who are relatives, like Surah Anfal, similar. And it was revealed around similar time as well. Uh, maybe Anfal slightly before, but that ayah from the end of Al-Anfal probably was revealed after this. 
in my opinion. So like Surah Tawbah around that time. So the Quran says that people who are related, you know, uh, close personal ties, okay? So blood relations, they have closer personal ties. They are, you know, closer to one another. We need to take care of them more. Uh, and then here this, we have this section uh, where Allah mentions, remember the time when they all united against you, Ahzab, they got together against you, but we saved you from them. You dug a trench in Medina, but Allah sent something amazing, extraordinary. Or you who believe, remember the grace of Allah bestowed on you when there came down on you hosts to overwhelm you, armies. But we sent against them a hurricane, wind like storm, and forces that you saw not. Angels came again on this occasion. But Allah sees clearly all that you do. So Allah mentions that. In that situation where the believers tried, tested, they were shaken as by a tremendous shaking, like earthquake. And behold, the hypocrites and those in whose hearts is a disease say, Allah, his messenger promised us nothing but delusion. Behold, a party among them said, you men of Yathrib. So Medina, another, the name of Medina was Yathrib. It was named Al-Medina after the Prophet. You cannot stand the attack, therefore go back. And a band of them asked for leave uh, of the Prophet saying, Truly our houses are bare and exposed like we need to protect our women. Though they were not exposed, they intended nothing but to run away. So hypocrite. Basically, we were looking for an excuse not to join the prophet in this battle because they were so worried. The alliances, the, the big army that was gathered will, will basically kill them because their iman was not strong. So uh, Allah mentions this here. And then uh, Allah says... Uh, Kullan say to them, running away will not profit you if you are running away from your death or slaughter. And even if you do escape, no more than a brief respite will you be allowed to enjoy. Like the death will come to you. You can't run away from it. Uh, so Allah knows, he says here, those who were truly believers and stood by you, prophet, and fought with you alongside, and those who were hypocrites, they ran away. So they will be punished. They will see the consequences here. And then the conclusion says, when the believers, true believers, saw the confederates, the forces, big forces, they said, this is what Allah and his messenger had promised us. And Allah and his messenger told us what is true. And it only added to their faith and their zeal in obedience. And among the believers are men who have been true to their covenant with Allah. Of them, some have completed their vow and some still wait, but they have never changed their determination in the least so that Allah may reward the man of truth for the truth and punish the hypocrites if that be his will. Or he can turn them to his mercy and forgive them because he's oft forgiving most merciful. So Allah says here, like the true believers stood firm by the Prophet ﷺ. Allah saved them, sent the angels, the storm, uh, and the confederates, the alliances, the big army dispersed. They had to, you know, they, they couldn't succeed. But there were some, you know, some incidents. So some uh, believers uh, were, they were martyred, uh, killed on that occasion. So Allah says they have fulfilled their covenant. They stood, they stood firm and they gave their life. But there were others who didn't, but later on they will. Like they, they, they are waiting for their moment. Uh, and then uh, this is the end here, but there is this ayah which uh, I have to read to you. Uh, we have indeed in the Messenger of Allah beautiful example of conduct for anyone who, whose hope is in Allah and in the last day and who remembers Allah often. Yeah. Uh, so this ayah is like a huge notion and principle. This is the end of the Jews. I'll stop here. Uh, that The Prophet is his example. So he came out. We, we always must follow his footsteps and he's the best role model for us. Uh, I think I've again, you know, taken all my time. I load the questions and I'll quickly. Okay, two questions. I think the page disappeared again. Briefly, inshallah, I'll tackle them. The literal speech of Allah is the Quran literal, or is it like when we say the mosque is the house of Allah metaphorically? So some are, some verses in the Quran are literal. We take them literally. 
but there are some verses which we can only understand metaphorically because they don't make sense to otherwise. So when Allah says the mosque is the house of Allah, it's metaphorical, like you said, you are right. So Allah doesn't stay there himself because he is out of the bounds of you know what we know of time, space, houses, and things like that. We cannot constrain Allah in any way. If I sleep after Fajr until one hour before us and then stay awake the whole night, reading Quran is it haram because I don't feel the hunger of fasting. I don't like the pattern necessarily. Uh, when you sleep intentionally and you don't intend to wake up for any prayers, that is not allowed. If you slept by accident, uh, even though you set up your alarm to wake up for Zuhr and Asr, but you had the luxury of sleeping because you feel hungry or something, then that is not haram. If you slept, when you wake up, you make up the prayers you missed in your sleep, Zuhr and Asr, and then you wait for the iftar and break your fast, okay? Uh, you stay awake at night, the whole night, reading Quran, whatever. Yeah, you, you know, whether you read Quran or not, again, it doesn't make the ruling different. Uh, like I just said, sleep after Fajr, set up alarm to wake up for your prayer, Zuhr and Asr, if you can afford to sleep the whole day, but I don't like the pattern, as I said, necessarily. It's not healthy, good. Uh, but nowadays, the nights are very, very short, as you know, so it's not a big deal to stay awake the whole night until Fajr and then sleep after Fajr but try to wake up, you know, by noon, for example, or something like that. Uh, is adoption haram? Yeah. So uh, this uh, is right at the beginning of next juice. So I will talk about this uh, uh, because it's a good question here. Uh, fostering a child. What is the ruling? Biological child, not. So let me talk about it tomorrow when I read that eye of Zaid, uh, because Zaid is mentioned by name, the only companion mentioned by name. What is the amana that was offered to heavens and earth and they refused it, but humans accepted it? Is it the free will and the ability to obey or disobey Allah? That also is part of tomorrow's Jews. This ayah uh, is right at the end of Surah Al-Hazza. Probably you read the whole Surah, mashallah, which is good. So let me, uh, you know, tackle this one as well tomorrow, inshallah. But in a nutshell, you know, when you asked, uh, the amana, the greatest amana is basically... Uh, that we will establish order on this earth and protect this earth, look after everything, okay? We will not corrupt the earth. We will establish the order that Allah wants us to establish. So that means looking after all other living creatures, so looking after animals and plants, everything else. And it means that our amana is that we are not all going to go astray and turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we'll stay, uh, we, we will stay... Uh, on the course of our covenant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the promise uh, that we can bear this and uh, we will not exercise our free choice of will like you pointed to in the wrong way, but we will instead worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is very, very related to the ability of, uh, you know, obeying and disobeying indeed, but in a more general sense, it is all about uh, being vicegerents of Allah on this earth representing being like Allah's agents on this earth and representing his divine will as to doing and ordering and establishing that which Allah wants us to order and do and establish. That's what, uh, my understanding of the greatest al-amana is. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم سبحانك اللهم نستغفرك ونتوب إليك ونصلي ونسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما وسلم تسليما كثيرا بارك الله فيكم والعفو منكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته إلى اللقاء